So uh, I actually began my career in, in research as a chemist. I worked in the private sector for about seven years doing biochemical research. Uh, I did this uh, for, as, as mentioned, many years. It felt like quite a few. And I loved it. I actually really enjoyed it. Um, I actually loved it so much that I began to feel guilty because I felt I needed to be sharing my passion for science with the next generation of future scientists, many of whom may be in this room and just don't know it yet. So as a result, I quit my job and I began teaching high school chemistry in hopes that I could bring my career into the classroom in a way that was a little bit more engaging than perhaps a textbook-based curriculum. One day, a career at NASA opened up that effectively allowed me to do both. Be close to exciting space science, and then at the same time, bring that into classrooms across California. Uh, I now have this incredible position where I work with schools across the state, helping teachers build their science programs and doing activities with students. Last year was a really interesting time in my position because of the solar eclipse. So I had the privilege of uh, working with thousands of students from all over the country, bringing them the eclipse viewing glasses and doing activities. It was, it was really quite, quite a fun time. Uh, but something else really interesting happened that day, other than this already amazing astronomical event. On that day, August 21st, millions of people from all walks of life walked outside and looked up. We all enjoyed this event predicted to the second by scientists. And not once did I hear anyone say, I don't think there's going to be an eclipse today. The eclipse is just a hoax perpetuated by the big astronomy lobbies. <laughs> not a single eclipse denier. Why would there be? In this instance, we trust scientists implicitly. Yet every year, as a teacher, I was asked if we staged the moon landing or if the Earth was actually flat. <laughs> you laugh. In fact, uh, we have organizations dedicated just to this conspiracy. I actually saw an exchange in between Elon Musk and the Flat Earth Society. <laughs> as a scientist and an educator, it's important we address what's happening here. I think it begins with how we communicate. Certainly we've all been in situations where we're frustrated at how little progress we're making in a heated debate, or maybe we felt intimidated that we couldn't share our views because we were outnumbered. We hear things like fake news or alternative facts, and this allows us to dismiss the entire conversation. It seems like it's getting worse in recent days, but humanity has a pretty long history of villainizing science. We call education elitism on our best days and sacrilege on our worst. I'm sure we're all familiar with the astronomical revolution where scientists like Galileo and Copernicus incurred a world of hurt for trying to describe our place in the universe. It's interesting that in some cases we trust scientists yet all of a sudden become incredibly skeptical in others. I'm reminded of how last year my grandfather had a stroke and I was absolutely terrified. When I got to the hospital, he couldn't remember the year or even my name. As soon as the doctor came in, my first reaction was, tell me what we need to do to make sure that this never happens again. I immediately leaned on the expertise of a trained professional. Help me. Help me glean from your knowledge what will help my family. Now, some people might have pursued a second opinion, and I respect that. Small strokes can actually uh, be very tough to detect. There's not a lot of physical evidence, as was the case here. It's okay to say, I need more information. But let me ask this. From whom would you pursue this second opinion? Clearly, it would be insane to say, I'm sorry, doctor. Uh, my neighbor has never seen anyone have a stroke before. He doesn't believe they're real. You two will have to resolve this. <laughs> this seems absurd, yet examples like this seem to be coming up more and more. When we watch the news, we've now kind of entered this split-screen mentality where you have a highly trained professional sitting across from a regular Joe and no headway or progress is ever made, right? The expert, typically a scientist in some form or fashion, is dismissed again as an elitist for citing facts and figures, while the regular Joe says things about anecdotes or gut feelings. In situations like this, it's 
it's, it's kind of tough to see how to move forward. I, I'm reminded of a quote by Isaac Asimov. And he said, anti-intellectualism has been a constant thread winding its way through our political and cultural lives, nurtured by the false notion that my ignorance is as good as your knowledge. It's with this in mind that I want to share a few steps with you guys to be sure that we don't engage in this type of behavior. The first step is we want to be sure that what we can do is uh, take a look at uh, being able to gauge whether it's the time or the place for a conversation. There's an entire field of philosophy called the philosophy of science. Authors such as Kuhn, Lakatosh, Popper, they explored what criteria made something scientific and also how to communicate across different paradigms. One of these criteria is what's called falsifiability or the ability to be proven incorrect. Look back at our example of uh, Copernicus and Galileo. Imagine you're living in those times and you're walking down the street believing that the sun moves around the earth. And now this crazy person comes up to you and he says, no, no, we're the ones swirling through space. What would you need to hear in order to be convinced? Would you ever hear this person out? This should be the first test for us. If at any point in time the other side is unwilling to change their mind, then what What's the point of spending the time? Why just be a continuation of this split-screen shouting match? The second step is a good scientist is careful not to be a victim of what they don't know. So I remember when I worked in research, uh, I found that a lot of this resentment in science comes from the fact that many people are often scientifically ignorant. I don't mean this to be condescending. Even as a scientist myself, there are entire fields of research I know almost nothing about. And while we can't all be scientists, we can at least work to think like scientists in our day-to-day. -day. I find a, a, a good example is uh, an ad campaign I love to show my students. I remember as a kid seeing these commercials of Michael Jordan sweating his bright color sweat, and I'd say to myself, with just a little bit more Gatorade, I could dunk the ball. Yeah. Now, never mind the fact that I'm not nearly tall enough, nor do I even know how to dribble. Uh, but we all know why. We all know why I have to drink Gatorade. Electrolytes. How many of us have actually stopped to ask, what is an electrolyte? What does it do? How does it make me jump higher? An electrolyte is actually just a salt. So Gatorade is effectively salt water packed with so much sugar that you can't taste it. And what happens when you drink salt water? You get thirsty. So what do you do? You buy more Gatorade. Oh. It's genius. It's the most genius campaign. Uh, similarly, uh, an online campaign was launched warning us of the dangers of dihydrogen monoxide. <laughs> Advertisements like this show you exactly why you need to be so scared. For those of you laughing, you get it. As chemists, I recognize that dihydrogen monoxide is the chemical formula for water. Now, people aren't always so aware. They call restaurants and ask if they test for dihydrogen monoxide in their foods. <laughs> Herein lies our problem. If we're not aware of how we're being taken advantage of, then how can we be on the right side of science? Lastly, once we're in the time and place to have a conversation, and we're armed with enough background information to begin, the third and final step is ask questions. This might seem counterintuitive because when we feel we know enough to have an opinion, we want to tell people what we believe. But asking questions actually really sets the tone for a conversation. It helps us identify the strengths and weaknesses of both sides. Imagine sitting across from a climate change denier and telling them it's supported by mountains of evidence, as found by Cook, 97% of scientists agree that our actions are having a negative impact on the planet. We track uh, in the atmosphere greenhouse gases and the effect that they're having on Arctic ice levels, as found by NASA and NOAA, two of the two premier organizations in climate research. In fact, not only do we monitor these uh, particulates in our atmospheres using technology that continues to astound me, 
We even track chemical indicators and ice cores that allow us to get a picture of what global temperatures looked like thousands of years before humanity ever filled up their first Hummer. Yet I've had very little luck sitting across from someone and telling them what they have to believe. Instead, I found more fruitful discussions have begun by simply showing them the data. Saying nothing else, I asked them, what is this graph showing? Not the data plus my interpretations, just what conclusions do you draw? Similarly, looking at the effects on Arctic ice levels, the same thing. What do you see here? How do you interpret this? Now, I want the other side to join me, but they have to set those terms, and I know those terms only by asking. If they look at these graphs and say, I need more information, nothing would excite me more. Tell me what you would like to see. A larger time window, like this. Perhaps you'd like to see orthogonal mechanisms of detection, like this. The more I ask, the more I can figure out what they need to join my team. Now, in situations like this, I, I understand that there's always going to be more conflict. We're always going to be in conditions where we want to, to get further than we do. And in these situations, I, again, encourage you, recognize it, state a little less, ask a little more. Embrace the value of saying, what if X? Would you change your mind if Y? When we're in situations of heated conversation, first listen to what other people are saying. If they start shouting at you about how climate change is fake because it snowed last winter, then we know that this is not the time or place. If instead, as before, you find yourself outnumbered and intimidated, remind yourself, just because someone says something in unison with many others, that doesn't make it any stronger. The plural of anecdote is not data. But instead, if you're actually in the proper place for a conversation, and we're all ready to genuinely partake in the process, again, tell a little less, ask a little bit more. Show people what led you to the conclusions you landed on, and we can start this debate where the conversation is always advancing. If instead we find that the questions we're being asked we don't have the answers to, then fantastic. Maybe we have more digging to do. Maybe that other person has shown us something pretty compelling. In the end, I hope that you guys see that there's a certain simplicity here that's actually a little relieving. This resentment of science the cure doesn't require us to all become rocket scientists. Instead, we can just think a little bit more critically, a little more scientifically in our day-to-day -day lives. You can start today by going to the grocery store and looking at how products are advertised to you. Find a bottle of shampoo that says, now with 20 natural ingredients, and ask yourself, why do I need 20? Was 15 not good enough? <laughs> Do I even care if my shampoo is natural versus unnatural or synthetically produced in a lab? I certainly don't want a natural shampoo if it's made of crushed, endangered frogs from the Amazon, right? Start small. The more we practice analyzing ourselves and our surroundings, the more we can learn to ask questions about each other. Because again, people are very rarely swayed by being told what to believe. Instead, once we've learned how to question, then we can learn how to talk. Thanks so much.